When word reached them that the Union Army was decamping from Savannah, where it had spent the holiday season, the white residents of Charleston were shook. Sherman's bummers, as they were colloquially known, had already made Georgia howl during a three-month march from Atlanta to Savannah. As they promised to turn their now notorious wrath upon South Carolina, Sherman himself wrote, Somehow, his troops had got the idea that South Carolina was the cause of all our troubles, and therefore on them should fall the scourge of war in its worst form. Charleston, the self-described cradle of secession, was where the seeds of rebellion had first been planted almost a half century earlier. The first shots of the Civil War had been fired from Charleston's shores towards the U.S. fort in its harbor. Charlestonians reasonably expected that Sherman's frothing bummers would reserve for the city their most violent fury. Aside from the Army of Northern Virginia, devoted to defending the Confederate capital at Richmond, rebel forces in the Eastern Theater had been reduced to nearly nothing. In early February, General Beauregard, who had ordered the firing on Fort Sumter four years earlier, withdrew his small garrison from what he recognized would be a futile fight, burning or otherwise sabotaging the fortifications and munitions in the city. The white residents of Charleston were left with a difficult choice. Most fled towards Virginia in advance of the Union hordes, forfeiting their property but hopefully escaping bodily harm. The other option was to stay, surrender, plea for mercy, and hope that Union officers would honorably protect them from bloodlust in the lower ranks. This, most believed, was the only chance of retaining any of the wealth accumulated in one of the richest cities in the South. And on February 18, 1865, Mayor Charles Macbeth delivered his city's official surrender to Lieutenant Colonel Augustus Bennett, who promised to spare the remaining residents a bloody conquest so long as they pledged obedience to the occupying army. Three Union regiments converged on the city from land and sea. These regiments were chosen by Sherman because he trusted them to respect the terms of Charleston's surrender, but they also carried with them an unmistakable message. Down the streets of the city, which had been most defiantly committed to the preservation of black slavery, marched the United States colored troops. Many of the men who converged on the citadel at what is now Marion Square had previously been enslaved in South Carolina. The white residents who had remained in Charleston with the hope of defending their property would have to accept the enforcement of martial law by men they regarded as property. It was a poetic humiliation, and the chafing of it showed almost immediately. Two days into the occupation, a white woman confronted Colonel Bennett at his headquarters and accused soldiers under his command, which she called your Negroes, of insolence. When asked to describe the actions which offended her, she said, they won't turn out of the sidewalks for you, and they will go up to a white man and ask him for a light for their cigars. She was laughed out of the room. To think of a citizen whose city narrowly avoided being violently sacked, complaining so haughtily about perceived violations of decorum, seemed to the officers, who all hailed from New England, base absurdity. But the exchange was overheard by one man who understood the subtext of this alleged insolence. James Redpath was a war reporter for the New York Tribune. This was not his first trip to Charleston. He had visited the city more than a decade earlier, ostensibly to cover the Southern commercial conventions. But Redpath's true motive for coming to Charleston, as revealed in his memoir, The Roving Editor, had been to study slave power so that it might be overthrown. He would later join forces with John Brown to pursue their shared dream of insurrection. But in 1854, he was doing reconnaissance work. In Charleston, Redpath found the nation's strictest and most ruthless apparatus for policing black bodies, 
pro-slavery extremists from other southern cities envied the infrastructure erected over a series of decades by men who were ever mindful of reinforcing their domination of a black population, which, by 1850, outnumbered whites by several thousand. At the center of Charleston's racialized policing apparatus were black laws. These applied not only to the enslaved population, but also to the growing community of free blacks, and crucially to black migrants, particularly the professional class of Afro-Caribbean sailors who were a fixture at the city's thriving port. The primary, responsible of the char primary responsibility of the Charleston City Guard formed in 1806 and continuously expanded thereafter, was enforcing the black laws via a rigid authoritarian system of surveillance, incarceration, torture, and execution. Among the infractions for which any black person might be arrested and abused in antebellum Charleston was failing to give the wall to white pedestrians, that is, to cede the right of way on a sidewalk by moving toward the street. As Redpath put it, rowdies take great pleasure whenever they see a well-dressed colored person with his wife approaching to walk as near the edge of the pavement as possible in order to compel them to go into the street or else incur the extreme and barbarous penalty of law. It was also illegal in Charleston for a black person to appear, appear within view of a white person with a lighted cigar. For this offense, the black laws prescribed 39 lashes on the bare back. After confirming with the outraged woman the locale in which she had observed what he suspected were conscious acts of civil disobedience by black soldiers, Redpath set off to observe for himself. He repeatedly witnessed members of the Massachusetts 55th Infantry demonstratively standing in the path of white pedestrians then politely asking the astonished men to light their cigars. Far from being a misunderstanding, as the Union officers presumed, Redpath wrote, There has probably nothing been done by American troops so offensive to the natives of a conquered country as was perpetrated when the first Negro soldier stepped up to one of the scions of chivalry here and asked him for a light. In defense of his alleged insolence, he quoted two lines from a famous poem by Robert Southey. But things like that, you know, must be after a famous victory. Mark Twain read much of Red Path's war reporting. He had been a printer's apprentice in St. Louis when Red Path first became a celebrity journalist during Bleeding Kansas, and was a devoted, if sometimes skeptical, reader of the New York Tribune, a paper he would also later work for. The Tribune circulated throughout the nation, particularly in urban centers like San Francisco, where Twain was residing when the U.S. colored troops converged on Charleston. Excerpts from Red Path's sensational reports were reprinted in several San Francisco papers. Twain was, by this time, well established in the newspaper business, having spent most of the Civil War employed as either a managing editor, beat reporter, or freelance correspondent. Like Redpath, he had worked for both profitable urban publications and village papers on the verge of bankruptcy. He was, as he would remain for the next half century, a member, a rapacious consumer, and a caustic critic of the American press. The winter of 1865 found him living a Spartan life, much of it spent as Redpath had a decade earlier, studying the makeshift mechanisms of racialized policing in an urban port city and plotting against them. In San Francisco, there was not, as in Charleston, a large free black population, but there was a sizable community of Chinese immigrants some of whom were in direct competition with Irish laborers and Anglo-Saxon or white ethnic business owners. Fear of the Chinese as an economic threat, the so-called yellow peril, was, at the time Twain lived there, a central fact of San Francisco politics. In the decades to come, this fear would radiate outward, 
leading to some of the most racist legislation and judicial decisions in U.S. history, used to deny Asian immigrants and Asian Americans their most basic constitutional rights, and eventually to ban Chinese immigration altogether. Much of the structural xenophobia of Gilded Age America was bench tested in San Francisco. But during the 1860s, white supremacy was enforced mostly by mob rule. As Twain realized after he witnessed the brutal murder of a Chinese laundryman in 1864. It is arguably one of the five or six most formative moments of Twain's life. Forty-some years later, he would look back upon the event as the first time he recognized that there was serious and solemn power in the Fourth Estate, though it was rarely effectively deployed. What he had witnessed was news, not news in the transitory and disposable sense, which might amuse and distract for a day or two, but news that was evergreen, potentially as captivating to future generations as it had been in the moment of conception. Time cannot destroy that interest, Twain wrote, cannot even fade it. Twain's employer at the time was the Morning Call, which was technically the most popular newspaper in San Francisco, with a daily circulation of over 10,000 copies. But it was also a penny paper, targeted at a broad blue-collar readership, which meant that its margins for both subscription and advertising were thin. Twain was hired by his own account as the call's sole local reporter, responsible for compiling enough material each day to fill at least a quarter of the printable space on the four-page broadsheet. His unsigned reports were interspersed amongst adver advertisements, wire dispatches, and other ephemera compiled by the managing editor, George Barnes. Twain described this work as soulless drudgery, requiring him to spend 12 hours every day on his beat before sitting down to, as he put it, spread this muck out in words, making it cover as much acreage as I could. Barnes was steadfastly opposed to allowing Twain to pad his columns with comical inventions and editorializing, as he had done for previous employers and as he would soon be doing for the call's competitors. So to fill his columns, Twain depended upon daily visits to the courts, theaters, and markets. In other words, he learned the reporter's trade, a trade which would continue largely unchanged through the 20th century. On a Sunday afternoon in the spring of 1864, as he crisscrossed the city between his usual haunts, he fell upon the scene that shocked him. As he described it, I saw some hoodlums chasing and stoning a Chinaman who was heavily laden with the weekly wash of his Christian, Christian customers. And I noticed that a policeman was observing this performance with an amused interest, nothing more. He did not interfere. For the first time since he arrived in San Francisco, Twain felt like his job mattered. Here was an event he could describe with considerable warmth and holy indignation. It needed no embellishment. There was fire in it, Twain said, and I believed it was literature. Most nights, by the time he submitted his columns, he was disgusted by them. But on this occasion, proud of an item that had come from a live heart, he went looking for it in the Monday morning call. It wasn't there. He recounts, It wasn't there the next morning, nor the next. I went up to the composing room and found it tucked away among condemned matter on the standing galley. Confused and disappointed, Twain confronted his boss, who explained to him that the call could not afford to publish articles criticizing hoodlums for stoning Chinamen. The hoodlums presumably belonged to the white working classes who were the stay and support of the morning call. They hate Chinamen, Barnes said, and he must respect their prejudice or perish. The event haunted Twain. It ruined his relationship with Barnes. He started actively shirking his responsibilities to the call, collecting a paycheck for as long as he could, then resigning before he could be fired. 
For the remainder of his tenure in San Francisco, he would never again hold a salaried post. He would become a permanent freelancer, liberated from any single editor's scruples. Twain started taking big, satiric swings at many targets, politicians, socialites, tycoons, other journalists, and the police. It's unclear whether Twain's preference for the gig economy of periodical publishing was a conscious strategy or just amenable to his bohemian lifestyle. But the result was that local, regional, and eventually national newspapers found themselves competing for his services. He wrote what moved him, fact or fiction, narrative or polemic, somber or riotous. Having created demand for his work, he no longer lived in fear of censorship. If editors or publishers found something he wrote too risky to print, Twain had only to shop it to their rivals, or threaten to. There was nobody he pummeled more often or with greater vitriol than the San Francisco police. Almost two years after he witnessed the disgraceful stoning of a Chinaman, the San Francisco Examiner commented, Mark Twain is still on the warpath. He is after the San Francisco policeman with a sharp stick. Twain was already, by the time he came to San Francisco, a jaded newspaper man, who well knew how media platforms were platforms were wielded by those in power to misinform and manipulate the masses. He had been a knowing party to coercive media power on several occasions, and not always reluctantly. So when he started down this war path, he did not indulge much hope of success. The police represented the city's wealthiest and most influential citizens, as did many of the newspapers. What hope did a freelance journalist have in the face of their collected power? He expected it was just a matter of time before he was silenced by collusion, bribery, or worse. In February of 1866, the San Francisco Dramatic Chronicle, a fledgling theater flyer, which would eventually grow into the city's flagship publication, printed some advice for their friend Mark who was not easily contacted by conventional means. Go home early. At any rate, don't travel late, particularly in dark streets. Don't walk alone overnight. Above all things, Mark, don't, under any circumstances, take a drop too much when there are policemen around, because you know they're a-laying for you. It was one of the darkest periods of Twain's life. Characterized by poverty, paranoia, binge drinking, depression, and open discussion of suicide. It is quite possible that exactly because he cared so little for his own life and expected so little from his future, Twain mustered the courage to fight police power which seemed insurmountable. As his crusade continued, he would be joined by increasingly powerful allies from the press, the theater, the merchant class, and eventually from City Hall and the California legislature. By initiating a flame war with the San Francisco PD, Mark Twain would come to realize that his literary talent was not merely valuable as a tool for entrenched power, but could be used as a weapon of resistance against it. The tyranny of traditional institutions would be a theme of Twain's work from the 1860s forward. To appreciate contemporary movements like Black Lives Matter, who call for defunding or abolishing the police, I am inclined, as Twain was, to look to the past. Not to pickle it, the metaphor he used to describe patriotic nostalgia, which blinds Americans to the sins of their history but because prejudice and political violence are often products of training. Many of our current police departments were constructed for the express purpose of oppressing people of color, and that originary mission can be difficult, if not possible, if not impossible to exercise, even hundreds of years later. A German prince, Bernhard of Saxe Weimar Eisenach, visited Charleston as part of his tour of North America in 1825. Prince Bernard 
had distinguished himself as a commander of the Allied forces, which defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, as both European aristocracy and a bona fide war hero. He appealed deeply to Charleston's chivalry, a title preferred by the local slaveholding elite. The Prince's welcoming committee included a member of one of the city's founding families, the inspector general in charge of Indian removal in the region, and a former governor of the state, who was accompanied by his 17-year-old second wife. They desperately wanted to impress the decorated prince, and so they showed him what they considered most impressive about Charleston, its carceral system. Though no stranger to militarized violence, Prince Bernard admitted to being startled by the police soldiers who aggressively beat the drums that signaled curfew for the black population of Charleston and then mercilessly beat those they arrested thereafter. It felt like a city ruled by medieval tyranny, yet his host acted as though it was an object lesson in the virtues of democracy. After touring the site, which would soon become the Citadel, as well as Fort Moultrie, the guardhouse, and the city jail, Prince Barnard was taken to the perversely named Sugar House. Prior to the Revolutionary War, the imposing building on Magazine Street had been a sugar factory, but now the sugar was purely euphemistic. Enslaved people from throughout the region were sent to the Sugar House to be tortured. In fact, within the city limits, the black laws made it illegal for residents to whip their own slaves because the city council had come to view domestic whippings as amateurish and therefore ineffectual. They determined that it was better to leave the punishment of fugitives, curfew breakers, malcontents, and violators of the black laws to the city guard, who were equipped for and practiced in a range of tortures, delivering them on an industrial scale. While Prince Bernard never stoops to impoliteness or open disapproval, he fails to understand why his Charleston hosts are so proud of their police and their prisons. Why do they prioritize showing him how to surveil, constrain, and brutalize black people? Prince Bernard had witnessed cruelty and racism elsewhere on his tour. He had visited slave markets, plantations, and quadroon balls, drawing the conclusion in his diary that slavery revealed Americans as barbaric inferiors to Europeans like himself. But while many Southerners he met were desensitized to the horrors around them, none were so staggeringly oblivious to it that they cast the violence of slavery as virtue, until Charleston. In his travel memoirs, Prince Bernard describes much of what he saw in the manner of a military man, registering details of the machinery and logistics of the sugar house, which less fastidious observers might have missed. Suffice to say, this testimony is gruesome, as James Matthews, a man who had been imprisoned and tortured there, wrote in 1838, I have heard a great deal said about hell and wicked places. But I don't think there is any worse hell than the sugar house. It is as bad as a place can be. For a historicist like myself, evocative descriptions of racialized violence at the sugar house create a quandary. They are news. According to Twain's definition, as he puts it, the eyewitness's narrative that stirs the heart today will as surely and profoundly stir it a thousand years hence. The permanence of primacy is what makes genuine news, and the durable ability to affect a reader is, at least for Twain, sufficient proof of a literary work's aesthetic and moral value. Genuine news transcends specific temporal, geographic, and political circumstances. The shared experience of the representational arts, including journalism, bind cultures together, linking past to present, present to future. Art is, at least for Twain, no less than the argument for God's existence. That we can be made through art to think and feel the thoughts and feelings of our ancestors and our descendants, 
temporarily eclipsing the wasteland of the living, is the best evidence Twain finds for the existence of a dimension that defies death. Undeniably, Prince Bernard's account of the sugar house makes palpable the terror and trauma of U.S. slavery, which many contemporary Americans prefer to suppress and deny. However, I am also persuaded by books like Sadia Hartman's Scenes of Subjection that narratives of American slavery, including many authored by scholars much like myself, are not the kind of news that liberates, as Twain hopes, but rather by fetishizing, romanticizing, and sensationalizing black suffering, reproduce that suffering. The pain and murder of people of color in U.S. history recycles endlessly in historicist narratives as either education, entertainment, or both. My insuppressible desire to persuade and to please incentivizes me to collect and curate accounts of racialized violence, amalgamating this selective archive with popular forms, gothic romances, sentimental novels, horror movies, torture porn. And by doing so, I risk not only reducing victims of slavery to their pain and degradation, but commoditizing that pain and degradation for my own self-interested purposes until all that's left visible from millions of vibrant, dynamic lives is a cliched collage of screams, welts, ropes, and blood. This quandary is exactly what animates my interest in the Civil War era writings of Mark Twain and James Redpath. They were, like myself, white men, who positioned themselves as abolitionists and allies of people of color. In each of their cases, one can identify occasions when they took mortal risks in defiance of racist institutions, which would otherwise have posed them no threat. But Twain and Redpath are best understood as witnesses, people who usually could not, or any way did not, prevent the injustices they saw, but who recorded those injustices. Sometimes they used the news they made to disrupt institutions founded upon white supremacy and to advocate for substantive reforms. They also used the news they made to earn a living, eventually a very good living. The question that drives this project, which I cannot claim to answer, is what are the trans-historical politics of witnessing? and then amplifying images of, of state-sanctioned, racialized violence. This is not simply a question about scenes of subjection set in, in the antebellum South, but about the reproduction of black suffering in popular cinema and television, and perhaps most of all, the viral circulation of recordings capturing the assault and murder of people of color by police. Far from being a regressive relic, as Prince Bernard suspected, Charleston's carceral system foreshadowed what was to come, to be imitated by other southern cities in the decades leading up to secession, and to be adapted after emancipation for the disenfranchisement and subjugation of black citizens. The phenomena which confused Prince Bernard is what we now sometimes call white lash, a delusional, distorted, and savage structural response to even nominal demands for black liberation, which insists upon further dehumanization. The white lash of 1820s Charleston was precipitated by three events, the Denmark Vesey Uprising, the Haitian Revolution, and the Missouri Compromise. Denmark Vesey was a formerly enslaved man who purchased his freedom by working as a merchant seaman and settled in the free black community known as the Neck, north of Charleston. Enraged by the black laws, among other grievances, Vesey set about organizing a revolt. He found numerous collaborators, both in Charleston and the surrounding counties, building a covert network which some historians estimate included thousands of people spread over hundreds of miles. 
Vesey's network may have been the basis of what Redpath would later call the Underground Telegraph, a secret communication system extending across several southern states. Redpath was convinced that the enslaved people he met in Charleston were more organized, more well-informed, and better prepared for revolution than any community he visited. Vesey's plot was exposed by an informant in the spring of 1822. The, ringleader, the ringleaders were executed. The intricacy and breadth of the conspiracy revealed during interrogations and kangaroo court proceedings shocked white Charleston. Many came to believe that only by a stroke of luck had they avoided the wholesale massacre, from which would have emerged a well-supplied insurrectionary army numbering in the tens of thousands. The fear generated by the Vesey uprising was bound up with what is arguably the primary boogeyman of antebellum Charleston, the Haitian Revolution. As a professional sailor, Vesey had visited many places where he was not subject to so severe discrimination as he was in Charleston, but none provided more stark contrast than Haiti, which also happened to be one of the nearest foreign ports inextricably integrated into the trade network on which Charleston's economy depended. After the first major slave uprising on the island, hundreds of white colonial settlers fled from Haiti to Charleston. And then, in 1821, an alliance of indigenous Haitians and formerly enslaved Afro-Caribbeans toppled the Spanish colonial government. Vesey used the Haitian example to convince prospective recruits that successful revolts were indeed possible. Unsubstantiated rumors circulated afterwards that he even had Haitian collaborators who planned to join him after he secured the port, either to pursue an invasion up the Atlantic coast or to facilitate Black Charleston's permanent escape from bondage. These events followed hot on the heels of escalating tensions between the northern and southern states, which were tempor temporarily alleviated by the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Politicians from South Carolina had aggressively used the specter of secession to secure more advantageous, advantageous terms for the legislative compromise but many believed they would need more than idle threats in order for their slave economy to endure the progress of Western expansion and Northern industrialization in the decades to come. More than any Southern state, South Carolina acted according to the theory that for the federal balance of power to be preserved, they had to be transparently prepared for secession and civil war. If Charleston felt to Prince Bernard like a city under siege, that's because it imagined itself as one. The city's leaders foresaw a series of mounting threats, internal and external, which they believed could only be vanquished by comprehensive militarization. The citadel was built to train white officers who would be loyal to the city and state above the nation. Fort Sumter was built to defend the city from naval invaders, whether from Boston or Port-au-Prince and the black laws and city guard were expanded to prevent future insurrections. The week after Denmark Vesey was put to death, the Charleston city guard was, for the first time, issued firearms. Leyland Jordan writes, Around the nucleus of this city guard, a modern police system gradually took form. It was an integral part of the system of race relations predicated upon the notion that all Negroes were domestic enemies who had to be kept constantly under surveillance and completely subordinate. The emerging carceral system which Prince Bernard described in 1825 had reached its mature form when James Redpath first came to Charleston in 1854. Far from bemoaning the martial law enforced expressly to prevent the kind of revolution he was plotting, Redpath believed Charleston's draconian policing had made the enslaved population more practiced in subversive resistance and more restless. Describing the sugar house to one of his abolitionist friends, Redpath wrote, 
Resembling a feudal castle in its external form, the infamous Bastille or the Spanish Inquisition in its internal management, it is an edifice which is des destined to be leveled to the earth amid the savage yells of insurgent Negroes and the shrieks of widowed ladies whose husbands shall have been justly massacred by wholesale. Or else, amid the cheers of true chivalry of the age, the assailants of slavery and the friends of the bondsmen, God grant over and above all that the sugar house of Charleston, by some means and at any cost, speedily be leveled to the earth, that it pollutes by its practices and its presence. In what he considered to be one of the true blessings of his life, Redpath lived to see his prophecy realized, standing with members of the U.S. colored troops in the ruins in February of 1865. But Redpath failed to recognize that racialized policing would not be abolished by the demolition of buildings. It was rooted in the hearts of men. A half a century after emancipation, the Charleston police would still describe the sugar house and the city guard with nostalgia and unselfconscious pride. Police Lieutenant Edward Cantwell wrote, that strenuous body of men I look upon as being the nucleus of our present police system in the city. The rules and regulations governing the city guard compare favorably with those of our present time. At a speech in New York in 1901, with numerous pol prominent politicians and police advocates in the audience, Mark Twain said, let us abolish policemen who carry revolvers and clubs and put in a squad of poets armed to the teeth with poems on spring and love. While Twain framed this in his usual comic style, to say such a thing in a venue such as the Lotus Club, knowing that his speech would likely be excerpted in newspapers across the nation, was to consciously troll New York's political elite including a former president of the New York City Board of Col Police Commissioners, Theodore Roosevelt, who had just been inaugurated as Vice President of the United States, and six months later would assume the U.S. Presidency. Those few who had followed Twain's career closely would have recognized that for him, police abolition was not a joke. Thirty-four years earlier, Twain had been arrested in New York City, he spent the night in jail, meeting fellow detainees, including a black man who had been brutally beaten by his arresting officers. Twain arrived at the conclusion that anybody can get into the station house here without committing any offense of any kind, and so he can anywhere that policemen are allowed to cumber the earth. He promised that the ordeal would teach me never to so far forget all moral principle as to com complement a police force again. This was not the first time he had criticized the police and the press, nor the first time he had been arrested on trumped-up charges, nor the first time he had noted that people of color received unequal treatment from law enforcement. Twain had spent much of the preceding three years denouncing the San Francisco police and their chief, Martin Burke. Burke had Twain arrested on the suspicion of public drunkenness and roughed up in an attempt to stop him from writing. The police harassed him with surveillance, warrants, and fines, including seizing proceeds from his first public lecture, a major moment in the history of stand-up comedy, ostensibly to pay his bail debt from when they'd beaten him up two years later, two years earlier. The intimidation tactics drove him temporarily into hiding, but didn't stop his barrage of incendiary articles. In a recent biography, Gary Scharnhorst argues that Twain's attacks on the San Francisco Police Department led the city to investigate the department and eventually the fascist People's Party to withdraw Chief Burke from its 1866 municipal ticket, ending his decade-long reign of terror. The police regime, which Mark Twain boxed with quite literally in San Francisco, had a no less sensational origin story than the Charleston City Guard. And though the details are decidedly different, the basic framework of authoritarian overreach, militarization, nepotistic cartels, and racial animus remain the same. <laughs>
Chief Burke was in charge of the militant wing of the so-called vigilantes, an extra-legal organization which, in 1856, violently overthrew San Francisco's municipal government, lynching four men and forcibly exiling every elected official or organizer associated with the Democratic Party. Burke literally took over the San Francisco jail with a cannon. Prior to the vigilantes, there was no professional police in the city. Every member of the tiny department was serving a short term appointed by elected officials. There were no career officers. But Burke needed a large, reliable force loyal to him and other members of the Vigilance, Vigilance Committee to ensure the preservation of their power in the years following their coup d'etat. Just as in Charleston the city guard was used to solidify minority rule, the department which persists in, in present day as the San Francisco police was inaugurated by Burke for the express purpose of oppressing the large Irish Catholic and Chinese populations who the vigilantes viewed as threats to their ongoing control of the city. Just as the city guard had done following the Denmark Vesey trials, Chief Burke issued his officers military uniforms and firearms. A grisly idiosyncrasy of the SFPD outfit was the Bowie knife, a mobile version of Charleston's sugar house, useful for torturing the Chinese retailers who failed to pay their police protection rents. As part of his duties for the morning call, Twain attended the arraignments of the San Francisco Police Court to make a brief history of the squabbles from the night before. He joked that they were usually between Irishmen and Irishmen and Chinamen and Chinamen, with now and then a squabble between the two races. But while the reporter repeatedly recognized, or immediately recognized, that these two ethnic groups were disproportionately targeted by the police, it took him some time to ascertain why. That the fascist regime which governed the city feared the Irish and the Chinese, and sought to control them with state-sanctioned violence, and by cultivating rivalry and racialized violence between them. Irish Catholics were a political threat. The democratic machine which had overthrown uh, which had been overthrown in 1856, reliably organized and mobilized the Irish Catholic population. The vigilantes had ex exiled or executed dozens of democratic leaders, temporarily paralyzing the most potent political infrastructure in the city. But they lived in perpetual fear of its reemergence. Priests, labor organizers, and anybody who propagated Celtic iconography along with genuine Irish mobsters, were subjects of constant police surveillance and intimidation. Known Catholics were barred from public service, including on the police force. The Chinese had no such political capital, but they were an economic threat. The vigilantes were run by the white Protestant mercantile class. Their original motive for overthrowing the democratic establishment had been to protect and strengthen their financial and commercial power. Their stranglehold on municipal governance drove down taxes and tariffs and improved the, their credit with brokers and counterparties on the East Coast and abroad. While the Chinese tended to be concentrated in low-wage service trades, Twain marveled at their industriousness and entrepreneurial ingenuity. The vigilantes feared them as capitalist competitors who might be able to open new supply chains, improve efficiency, and introduce new products and services. While the Chinese were obviously objects of the same kind of police harassment as the Irish, they also had to contend with police-enforced racketeering as the vigilantes attempted to hamstring their co commercial development. Among the Twain polemics against the San Francisco PD which survive is a May 1865 editorial for the Dramatic Chronicle titled The Wickedness of the Police. As the title itself were not sufficiently vitriolic, Twain's first sentence asserts, Police are the greatest scoundrels in the community. <laughs> 
And his second, that citizens are in much greater danger of outrage and extortion from Chief Burke and his myrmidons than from malefactors who they pretend to guard us against. It is a dense and indeed prophetic mythological analogy. The myrmidons pledged allegiance to the tragic Greek hero Achilles in advance of the Trojan War. In Homer's Iliad, which Twain read repeatedly, Achilles is portrayed as an arrogant, hedonistic, and short-sighted commander. In his thrall, the Myrmidons become debauched and disorganized. While Achilles' famous death is not depicted in the Iliad, Homer's verses anticipate it, leaving the impression that the Myrmidons will find themselves rudderless and exposed, never able to live up to their unearned reputation as a great fighting force. If the SFPD are the Myrmidons to Chief Burke's Achilles, then Twain is the coward, Paris, firing arrows randomly into the fray. But Paris's arrows do, at last, prove fatal. Later in his career, Twain would take aim at presidents, kings, generals, and other autocrats, but the first tyrant he felled was Chief Burke, initiating an era of police reform which was substantive, but insufficient. Twain had launched his career from the San Francisco newspaper scene, but he soon left it and his activism behind. By 1867, both Twain and Redpath were again on the move, leaving behind reformist agendas which, though attained at considerable cost, seem rather meager in retrospect. They were each in their 30s, a rather advanced age for men in the 1860s, and neither had much to show for himself. No property, no family, not even steady employment. All, that would soon, all of that would soon change. Twain sought out Redpath in Boston, and together they launched the American Vandal, the most profitable lecture tour of the era. Thank you.